in period uh, these days. Um, so yeah, I don't know, that's, that's kind of my immediate thoughts. Um, I was going to say, well, I guess just to start off with saying that, well, after you said you're a real historian, I felt a little bit exposed. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 it, and, my, and my question or comment must come against that background. That oh, so I'm going to take a leaf out of your book. You don't have to be trained as a historian. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Yes, but but I guess where where my where my question is going, it would help me if I were, if if I was a historian, because I must be I must be honest with you. And uh, as I listen to you, it just sounds like you're being incredibly generous around um, around the the, the 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 black intellectuals of the time being being liberals and not necessarily being elitist, and then just putting it down to to their actual brilliance. I, in my, yeah, in my reading of, 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 the, of, of the period, which isn't particularly deep, you, you definitely get the sense that, or certainly not you, I certainly get the sense that the way in which um, the, the black intellectuals that you're talking about who have, who have, who have, who have Christian, who have been schooled overseas, uh, and the way in which they align themselves with with the uh, traditional authorities and, and, and traditional leaders do absolutely see themselves as, as, as intellectuals, do not see themselves as necessarily being um, uh, aligned, aligned with the masses beyond the fact that they see themselves as, as almost natural leaders who, who must take on the cause and, and, and and, and and once and once they get uh, once they can attain a assimilation through liberalism, they will decide what's good for what's good for everybody else. So I, I I must say I hear you, and I just think it sounds it sounds very generous. But I haven't studied the period enough to point to to point to to, to specific examples. But um, so so again, then when you seem to suggest that the, the through the liberalism, there was the there was the possibility of of liberation, or they saw themselves as being liberated. My kind of gut instinct, now speak of gut instinct. My gut instinct is like no, actually, my reading of it is that they were quite happy to be assimilated, and what they what they saw what they sought after was a, was a simil, was assimilation, because they saw themselves as having. Um, Risen above nativeness. So, so yeah, but no, yeah, I'm not a historian. No, 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 no. I think <laughs> you're raising some really important and valid points. Um, I'm going to just answer him before um, I forget. Um, but no, I think you're right. And I think part of my reading, I mean, my reading is very much rooted in the, in the documents, and I extrapolate from that. But I think a lot of my analysis does come from an effort to reclaim them. I think my feelings were a little bit hurt when they were called sellouts in recent years and have been discarded as the, the nonsense of, of liberation politics. And um, they, this is not mass liberation. Um, it's, it's liberalism and um, most people will fall by the way, wayside in any implementation of liberalism. But what I'm trying to do is um, recover uh, an understanding of race that was developed in the time that talks about a different way of being black. And I think I would agree with you that they saw themselves as above nativeness, but I think that they never saw themselves as separate from their ethnicity, their clan, their places of origin. Um, all of them who are journalists wrote in English and in the vernacular. Um, all of them, I mean, the newspapers, so a lot of how newspapers worked at this time, how literature in general worked at this time, is that a few people would be literate in an area, and a newspaper would be available in an area, and literate people would read to everybody else. So information was shared, uh, knowledge was circulating, and people who were literate played an important role in making this accessible to people more broadly. So there was this way 
that people who are part of this um, educated tradition were always located in their areas. And I don't know how much has changed today. Very few middle class black people, I think, can ever separate themselves from the former locations. Um, we've all got cousins and siblings and aunts and uncles. And even if you think of yourself as above a certain type of I don't know, black politics or aesthetics or something, there's a binding there that's very hard for people to divorce themselves from. I mean, some people do successfully. But um, I think throughout this time, they all assert deep pride in localism and local politics. Um, as much as they identify as global black citizens in locating themselves as part of the black diaspora intellectually and politically, they are always coming back home to write. Um, native life is all about the local. Um, the Bantu past and present that Mulema writes while he's based in Edinburgh is all about uh, Barolong traditions. Like, um, never mind when you go to the Cape, like Kosa literature is deep and beautiful and rich. And um, it's very much located in the changing local, I think. Um, so they might have seen themselves as about natives, but I don't think that divorces them from a very important type of race politics. If we want to call that race, which I do, but we don't necessarily have to call that race. <laughs> there was a hand back there. Um, I guess also start from looking at the part of saying, say, I don't understand. I don't know what to call actually You understand more than you know. <laughs> but I think, do we not run the risk of romanticizing the role of the middle class and the so they don't go in kind of helping to raise up a conversation about that politics? Because we're going to get into, I fear that we're going to get into a moment of making ourselves feel better about the work that we're doing because, oh no, we're not divorced from the, the majority of the black native, although we might think of ourselves as better. That on its own for me raises a red flag. How can you, it, it, it makes me wonder a bit about this thing of trying to dispute this thing of elitist because that is elitist in a way. You see yourself as better than, but you can also, but you make yourself feel better about it because you say, oh no, but my narratives are about that. But we know that from the West writing about us, there's a dynamic in someone writing about you. So just because you're black and you're writing about that story doesn't make you much elitist. I don't know if I'm making sense. You so make it I don't know. It's, it's, it seems like, it's particularly in this room, when I'm reflecting on myself, I could easily use this narrative to make myself feel better about me being here and the fact that I'm going to write these narratives but say, oh no, I'm still tied to my locality, uh, to Fimbab or whatever. But that tie is involuntary. It's something I haven't found a way to negotiate out of it. But if I had the role, then I would be, so in a way, these natives who decide how the natives will, will they, in a way, you are in the point of deciding how the other natives will come into the conversation about liberalism. So how, I don't know. I, like the, the, I, have, I have strong views on this, but I want to open this up <laughs> because I think you've um, raised such a productive and um, fertile question here. And I think that um, this is one of those issues on which many people in this room are experts. So uh, I want to open up the floor. <laughs> yeah. I w I'm not sure if it's tied to what she Talk just to said. Her. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's tied to what you said, so I don't know if I'm going in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. But um, what something that you said struck me about how they um, connected their the word native uh, versus foreigner to like uh, loyalty to the state um, as opposed to as opposed to race and it just made me think about how we think about race in in South Africa in relation to the rest of the continent mm -hmm. which um, there's an exceptional exceptionalizing of the the experience of South Africans particularly black South Africans with race maybe it's because it's it's uh, still a young democracy I'm not sure but even this idea of the native as equaling um, this the subject of the state, what does that mean in relation to our relationship with the rest of the country and and just statehood as as a marker of belonging and and how that then plays out in today's politics and today's um, regional politics in in the continent. So I think it is tied to to what you were saying, which is. 
that it's it's comforting to be like, oh well, they were trying with what they had, but it's also like, yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's deep, and I'm going to keep it in the floor because I think there are lots of ideas here. Just yeah. as my last implication, if I just looking, we make the example of the ZCC, but the ZCC would see itself better than a Macau. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they would be. <laughs> I don't know, but they wouldn't be the same. So even though the ZCC would merge what they liked of what, what was there in Amar Kaaba, but would also take some of the things, because now they have the Christian background and are making themselves better. For me, that's a mark of the being elite. I don't know. Yes. If you don't raise your hands, just go for it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the commodification of education um, has also created a problem in that, um, I mean, as, as soon as it's become commodified, it, 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 it divorces you, I, I think, from, from, once you came, from where you came. And it becomes something that, that um, uh, elevates you to this elitist. And I think by design kind of divorces you from, from where you come from. So um, I'm trying to think where I was going with this. But uh, um, yeah, I was just trying to like challenge the commodification of, of education and how that's developed this elite mentality um, um, once people, especially black people, become educated in the school um, and how and how their relationship from where they come um, becomes strained in that regard. So just a quick question. So is politics at the level at which we were talking this morning, and when we were talking about constitutions and state formations, is that always just elite politics? Yes. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, um, I do think that, so I do think there's room for um, influence from uh, the so-called grassroots, um, but any, any time there are 12 people in a room making decisions. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious what the room thinks. Can I just add to what you said? Um, because, I mean, I, I just think that what you are pointing to is so important. At the same time, it's a global thing. I mean, when I look at different uh, contexts um, and in, in which so the, the position of the middle class and thinkers or even revolutionary thinkers that come out of the middle class and the ways in which they patronize and in which they see um, subjects of other lower classes, working class, or so-called, I don't know, um, you know, unemployed, proletariat, and so on, uh, is it, there, there is a specific language that you can trace through different geographical contexts, and then at that time, at that time, because now the question is, or one of the question is, how um, these, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, liberals, um, uh, how progressive they were, for instance, and then and that progressiveness is not linear at the same time. But when I think of who were the progressives, for instance, in Iran at that time, they also had a middle class status, and many, many, you know. Uh, ideas about what justice is got silenced. And from then until today, when we look at, for instance, how the so-called Persians, <laughs> who speak dom dominantly Farsi, speak about the Kurdish, for instance, as savages and people who cut off heads and they are so, you know, you can, they are so regressive and which roots back to, which roots back to that there is a strong political movement historically in, uh, in so-called Kurdistan, but then in between the Kurdish as well, there is a narrative of who is a real Kurd. And then who is a real Kurd is the one, you know, who fits into a discourse, and then minority language speakers inside the Kurdish, again, are being excluded. And then how we see justice and how this, so when, I don't know, when we read history in this way, it just makes the complexity of it so, I mean, for me, complicated, and at the same time, yeah, I don't know. Hey, go for it. Uh, so, m my question is actually, 
what, what you would say towards the end of your presentation. Uh, you were distinguishing between the settler and the colonizer. Mm -hmm. and so my question is, wha what is the significance of that distinction? Because to me, the results were the same. Mm -hmm. um, because as you're talking in that way, I felt like if you have to narrate history in that way, yeah, we seem to reinforce you know, the apologetics theory in a sense. Mm. So, when you look at um, settler societies around the continent, we have South Africa, we have um, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Tanzania to some extent, but there are a number of um, settler societies. I mean, South Africa is not the lone settler. Um, it's perhaps the biggest white population, but we have them throughout. And when you look at liberation movements, you're right, there was a lot of commonality. And it's, um, I don't know if you, how familiar you are with feminist theory, but it's like feminist and womanist. It's like they're the same family, but different uh, branches. So um, they'll have a lot in common. They, they're coming from the same branch, and at some point, they're splitting off like this. And I think there is something important about white people who lay a claim to a place as their home because of the way that it displaces black people. There was land dispossession throughout the um, continent. There was indirect rule and tribalism and all of that throughout the continent. But I think when a black majority, when over 80% of the population is put onto 7.5% of the land and told that that's where they belong and white people don't just occupy it and mine it and exploit it, they own it, it's theirs. I think it's a different type of colonial experience. Um, and it's like different in the accents and infl in inflections, um, even though the substance of it is, is similar. So I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but when you think about liberation struggles in Ghana versus Zimbabwe, um, I think they look different, in part because of the ways that white people in the two British colonies <coughs> thought about their relationship to the place. I want to hear more though, because we don't look satisfied. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, uh, I'm still trying to uh, grab my mind on No, that say more. Course. It's, an, it's, a, it's a very important conversation to have in South Africa. Yeah, I mean, because I was judging it solely on the result, you know. Okay. Yes, because the result was the same. You know, black mm -hmm. people still suffered. You know, whether you came as a settler, you know, I, I don't think it mattered at the end of the day. So I was just trying yeah. to understand the distinction, you know, because if the result is the same, then why make a distinction? Because I mm -hmm. feel like if you have to narrate history in that way, you know, you are coming out. Like here's someone, you know, uh, like of an apologetic theorist. Mm. Um, there's one point I wanted to make, um, but I don't want to. I don't want this conversation to die because I think it's a great one and a really productive one. But we still have a whole other session. But something else that is important um, that I do in the paper that this is part of that I didn't do here is the creation of black identity and white identity always alongside and in conversation with each other. So um, there's a lot that's been theorized about black subordination, its psychic effects, its social, political, economic effects, all of that. But what does it do to you as a person to be trained um, and taught to look at other people not as people? Like what does it do to your, to your soul to understand the people with whom you engage every day as um, inferior to you on an inherent level? And um, what does it do to you when you can't love people who are, are racialized differently to you? Like love, not in a fetishizing way or a, you know, guilt way, but love in a transcendent way that love is supposed to look like. What does that do to you as a person when the only possibilities that are put forward in how you think about yourself 
force you into this way of seeing the world and seeing yourself and seeing other people. I think that's a really important conversation to have as we're talking about the creation of Native as, as childlike and subordinate and all of these things. And the people who are creating these, the white people who are creating these, and the white people who then live them out over the course of their lives. And not just the white people who are legislating it, because as Feinberg shows, almost all of the state action is driven from the bottom. It's petitions, it's farmers, it's workers, it's mine workers, it's all sorts of white people who are like, you have to look after us. You must protect our interests. You must make sure that we're safe in this country. You must make sure that we're prospering. You must make sure that being white means something here. And uh, they are pushing the state constantly to say, you're not going far enough. You're not going far enough. Why do I still have a white a black neighbor who's earning more than I'm earning. Like, this is undermining the whole white project. Like, do something about it. Like, it's important for us to think deeply and critically about what this does to white people in the creation of this system. And um, I, I, yeah. Isn't that a conversation white people need to be having amongst themselves, though? Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, we, we, we spend so much time, and part of this conversation is really goes to the root of black people navigating their blackness and what that means and how today sitting here we see that as like a dissatisfactory effort but really it's it's we we do it on a day-to-day -day basis here right where um you you know that being in this space makes you an elite but you're like okay but i'm still trying to keep those connections and how do i do that and how do i use my elitism to connect back to home etc and and so for us to to continue to ask black people to create those answers for white people, um, I think maybe the reason why that they, that they feel that, okay, the government is not doing enough to protect me, etc., is because they themselves were promised that. And that goes way back to before they settled. When they were coming here, they were told, you are guaranteed this and this and this. And so when they don't see that, they're like, wait, what's happening? This is not part of the deal. Um, and and so, white people need to go back to <laughs> whoever made them the, those promises and said, first of all, you know, you made a promise you couldn't keep, and you shouldn't keep, and 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 that's a conversation that needs to happen in a certain space, and m m maybe we'll we'll be part of that conversation in that we'll hear it anyway, in the same way that the conversations that we have amongst ourselves as black people, white people are part of. But for us to be spearheading that conversation to unpack what has been done to us for other people, I think is a bit, I, I don't even know that we would have the answers, honestly. No, I'm right there with you. What I'm trying to say, what I was trying to say though, is that racial formation doesn't mean the creation of blackness. It means the creation of race. And I think a lot of times when we talk about race in South Africa, we talk about blackness, and everyone studies blackness. Mm. I mean, black and white people, like the number of white academics who are studying black issues is, you know what it mm. is. So um, what I'm saying here is not that it's your political project, or it should be your political project to do this. I'm saying if we're going to talk seriously about race in South Africa, we can't talk about blackness as though it exists by itself, um, and as though black people are going through these things and white people are bystanders, mm. or whiteness is a bystander. Mm. Uh, thanks, Chuto. Um, just this conversation is reminding me of, uh, I took a class with Melissa Stein. She was at sociology in 2008. The course was called at Diabetes Studies. Which I took in the room, is she here? No. But my classmate there. <coughs> so Melissa was teaching about race. And her argument was because racism is, is about power. Uh, so black people cannot be racist, and so she would support the argument. And the white classmates went to the um, HOD, at the time it was David Cooper, who was HOD in sociology, to say this course must be shut down. And it was shut down. Melissa says, where is she now? She's, I think she's at this. Yes. I remember it was holidays, December. We were getting emails. I got an email from Melissa 
say, those who enjoyed the cause can they please write to David Cooper and share their experience because some white students have gone to say they are being taught bullshit, they are being taught that they are racist and that people can't be racist. So I support the comrades over there that this conversation is really crucial for white people to spearhead and I like what you're saying that lots of white academics who are studying blackness and it's really about time that they also put as much effort in integrating whiteness. Um, so mine is mine is more of a question, and it, I think it ties into the point of the elitism and how it constantly replicates itself. Mm -hmm. And so I, I keep wrapping my trying to wrap my head around the idea that the black intellectuals were using the word native, which at that time was already, already had um, derogatory undertones, mm -hmm. and what they were trying to do was redefine the parameters of what counts as native by making a distinction with something else. But, but I think the very act of using the word was already playing the game on, on the wrong terms. And so I, I, don't, I don't know if it is, if it was, if they were being naive or if they were unduly optimistic that they could change it. And, and I think Maybe um, an example in this time would be the, the, the discussions around the use of the word nigger. And so for me, it goes to, to the, what informed that kind of thinking that they would want to conscribe that word and try to redefine it. And not taking cognizance of the implications of that word to the local uneducated black person, if you, if you were to refer to him as a native. How would he feel? And so um, my question is, what would the what was what what did the word mean? And I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. So it wasn't quite the N word. It was a racially loaded word, but it w didn't carry that It didn't carry that level of violence. I mean, like. In the U.S., to use that example, mm -hmm. they had Negro and then there was the N-word. And Negro was still, you know, a word that was later changed, but it still wasn't that. Um, I read them as strategic performance of acceptable language to try advance a cause. But um, I am very sympathetic towards this particular group of people. And I think you're right that um, there is a violence in using the master's tools to try to dismantle the master's house. Um, and it's difficult to know exactly what other options they had available to them. It's, it's possible that they just had such a disproportionately loud voice that other options aren't even visible to in the archives now because they took up so much space, the liberals. That's entirely possible, but with what we've got to go off of, they didn't have a lot of options to work with, is my reading. But that doesn't mean that this was necessarily the best course of action, but I think it made sense to them at the time, and it seemed like a worthwhile course of action, because within the set of possibilities, it offered them something useful. But um, I want to go, I'm sorry, I, I missed your name at the back. And I think this relates, like you said, relates to her point that this is a group of uh, upwardly mobile people who want to keep moving up. Um, yes. Um, just picking up on Rami's point about how elitism always sort of recreates itself and gives birth to itself over and over again. I don't know if it's, in, inherent in us humans or if it's taught behavior to only see things in binaries. Um, and why I say that is it's either you're this or you're that. So once you become liberal, um, you cannot, not necessarily, you're, not that you can't, but there's an unwritten rule 
that if you are in a UCT space, if you are an Ivy League educated person, there's no way you can then go back and um, identify or um, be able to speak to the experiences of where you might come from mm -hmm. because you've joined this now elite space. Mm -hmm. And um, the definition of words change with time. What was known as liberalism then and what it is today, two totally complete, completely different things. Mm -hmm. But one thing that didn't change is the hierarchy, the, the need to always have a power dynamic. And that's created with, by by this binary opposition that it's either you're liberal and when you're liberal you tick all of these boxes. If you dare not tick one of them, then oh, oops, back to native status you go. And if you and if you are sort of in this middle ground, it's almost like you are lost and always constantly searching for where you belong. And that's where in South Africa the term coconut comes into play and why sometimes it's so violent when you go back after spending a semester at university, you go back to the township, all the rural areas, and you're turned a coconut. Because yes, you do tick these these boxes, you are educated, you speak a certain way, but also you tick these boxes that you come from this place. So you don't belong to this list, so you belong here in this middle ground that, that traps you in a, in a space where you're constantly searching and feel the need to constantly um, introduce yourself, define yourself. Uh, you can never just really be. Um, I'm going to ask um, something of you for the next session. Um, let's pick up some of these conversations because I think they're really fertile, productive conversations that we've just left. But I want to ask you to think of a question. I just skim, just skim some of this, especially. The hard, uh, the hard Feinberg, and the Kuzwayo, and a bit of the Tembeka. Like choose one, skim a little bit of it. Like skim, 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 and um, think of a question. And your questions are going to drive the second session. So um, that's my ask for the next section. So we'll be taking from 1910 onwards, and you can say when we start with onwards. Okay, so maybe I can jump in for a second then. Um, uh, my name is Kelly, I'm from the Centre for Law and Society. Many of you know me in various other guises. It's good to see you all. Hello, those behind the pole in this very weirdly configured room. Um, so from, from CLS's side, Tuto, thank you so much for partnering with us and Dee as the chair, partnering with CLS in the whole series of lunchtime conversations that we'll be having uh, today, tomorrow, Wednesday, Friday, next Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. Uh, we're going to be busy at the center for the next couple of days. And it's always so wonderful to see the alignment between the work that CLS does in opening conversations about all the ways in which the law is great, not so great, obstructive, a really great tool, things we need to think about um, as we think about how we come on, out of this uh, institution as somebody who uh, practices law and works with the law and does law in various different ways. So for us, it's an enormous pleasure to be able to partner with both of you and especially to host you, Tuto. 